as I say, I'm so, so excited about being here this evening. And I know myself, Leanne and Danny um, are as well. Um, I'd just like to start our ceremony uh, with a call to worship. And that call to worship comes from Luke 4, verse 18 to 19. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Thank you. Dear Lord, let us practice love in action. Help us rise and pledge our word. Let us bring an end to fear and danger. By faith, we can unlock the door to treat a stranger. Grant us the wisdom your heart can provide and let justice flow down like a river. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Peace, salam, shalom. I'd now like to introduce you all to the final keynote speaker of the 2020 European Peace Colloquy webinar series and the recipient of the very first Community of Christ European Peace Award. Keith Hebden is a peacemaker's peacemaker. He was the founder organizer of Leicester Citizens UK, which is now in its third year in the city. He is passionate in his fight against poverty and giving voice to those who normally do not get heard. He is a very good organizer, reaching out to build a team of people from different ethnicities and faiths in Leicester to advocate for justice. He first started community organising in Mansfield, Nottingham, and has led sessions at Greenbelt on Citizens UK. Community of Christ in Leicester is a partner organisation of Leicester Citizens UK, and Keith has been so very encouraging of our involvement as a congregation. Currently, Keith is working for Leicester Citizens UK on their living wage for care workers campaign. Keith calls himself a recovering vicar. He was a vicar in Mansfield, Nottinghamshire, and deanery advisor for Seeking Justice for four years, and then left to be the director of the Urban Theology Unit in Sheffield, where he was helping, to ask, helping people ask questions about what God is doing in our cities and how we can join them. Then he came to Leicester to work practically on organising ordinary people to identify issues and bring them to the attention of the mayor and city council in order to improve things. After a listening campaign with 1,500 different people, Leicester Citizens UK identified mental health, homelessness and knife crime as big issues for lots of people. In April 2019, the two leading candidates for Leicester mayor, for Leicester's mayor faced an audience of nearly 400 people and were asked questions on their commitment to these issues. Lola and I, both from Leicester's congregational youth groups, were timekeepers for this. Over 50 others from different faith communities, charities, schools and universities spoke that evening. His books also suggest something of his faith and commitment. Seeking Justice, The Radical Compassion of Jesus, Reencharting the Activist, Spirituality and Social Change, Dalit Theology and Christian Anarchism. Keith is a person of faith, a strategic thinker and a non-violent activist. He works with skill, wisdom, humour and genuine friendship to empower and mobilise many others from different faiths and organisations. He is a great teacher. Keith knows and appreciates community of Christ and what we stand for, helps us work more effectively and with many others for the kingdom of God on earth. Keith, welcome and thank you for being the final keynote speaker for the 2020 European Peace Colloquy webinar series. Thank you so much. Uh, for, I mean, for such lovely and encouraging words. And, and I'm not saying you don't mean them. I know you do. It's just that you don't normally hear those kinds of things about you until your funeral. So I feel I feel really lucky to hear such lovely things, and still be here to hear them. <laughs> and uh, and as I, I shared uh, amongst friends earlier today, um, 
the last time I think I won an award, I was six, and it was an award for effort, and I got a book of British birds. So um, I'm just really chuffed uh, to be with you and to be able to present today, uh, uh, as you've been hearing so many people. And it's exciting to see all the names and places in the chat. Um, before I go further, in case you're curious as to the background, there's, there is no ceiling behind me. Uh, I'm sitting at home where we're in the middle of some serious work. <laughs> so that's why there's no ceiling. All the wires have been taken out. So I'm sorry if that's a bit distracting. So I'm going to be as indulgent as I can and mostly just tell stories, really. And I'm going to try um, and keep an eye on the comments. So if while I'm talking, you wanted to um, put anything there, I will be keeping half an eye on that. And it may steer what I say uh, as I go. So I have a plan, but it's always a loose one. So feel free to pitch in uh, in the chat box as we go. And I guess it's, it's a story about conflict uh, inside myself and conflict between me and the world, one which we all probably face and experience. They say, if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. And I don't remember ever really not being angry. Um, and, uh, and for some people, then they never are. And, uh, and I feel, you know, lucky them. But uh, also being brought up uh, in faith in the church in Wales and uh, in a fairly conservative upbringing, but then radicalized, I realized now, by my teachers at school. I think our government are probably right <laughs> about uh, school and education generally and the radicalizing effect that learning can have on people. So I read uh, when I was 17, two things that really didn't come together for me, but should have. And a lot of the journey after that was me trying to bring them together. One was Acts chapter two, and I remember underlining it in my Good News Bible uh, and writing capital letters there. Alleluia. It just resonated with everything. The idea of a community of people who held all things in common. And I read at the same time uh, Karl Marx's Das Kapital, being a, a, an enthusiastic politics geek. And I never at any point made a connection between those two things, those two radical texts. I think until uh, I was fortunate enough to spend six months in India uh, soon after that. And um, two things, really. One, realized my privilege and power. Anyone uh, with my color skin who's been as a person of faith abroad to do uh, whatever we might call it, mission, good works, ministry, will realize you can do so many things that really um, you're not qualified to do. Doors are opened. And I found this deeply uncomfortable, as I'm sure others here who've experienced that felt that uncomfortable. And I didn't know what to do with that. But I met and spoke with Dalit activists. And uh, the Dalits uh, are people who self-name themselves that. Um, they call them the Harajan, uh, others call them untouchables or scheduled caste. Dalit means crushed or of the earth. And they are outside the caste system. And they taught me that the way I read the Bible depends on what my experiences are of the world. and. I began to realize that I should never from then on attempt to understand or read scripture on my own. And it should always be with people who are on the sharp end of injustice. And so that kind of marks the beginning of a journey of bringing together faith and politics. And that went from trying to find a way to connect the two to a point of realizing that they weren't separate in the first place, discovering, as I'm sure many of you have, that uh, the faith that we have inherited is one that grew up out of politics, out of struggle. 
I um, went on to discover the anarchist movement in East London particularly, and the Catholic worker movement, who I think for Community of Christ you may have some affinity with, and it might be some people on here, give me a shout in the chat box if you have any connection with the Catholic workers. They were founded by Dorothy Day in the Great Depression in New York in the 1930s and by uh, Peter Morin. I should mention him. We're being translated into French, so if I don't mention Peter Morin as well, that would be a miss. So um, I discovered the Catholic workers and their houses of hospitality, their works of mercy, their radical living, but also their direct action, their commitment to non-violent direct action and to being anti-peace. Uh, sorry, anti-war. <laughs> um, probably we're all slightly committed to being anti-peace if we look deep down. Their commitment to anti-war work, which involved uh, personal sacrifice and often uh, being arrested or uh, put in jail or even prison. Uh, and a friend, Kieran O'Reilly, who um, faced potentially 10 years in prison for disarming an aeroplane in Ireland that was on its way to Iraq. And uh, at the time, I was part of a charismatic, evangelical, very conservative church, trying to square the two, uh, the faith I was in with the activists that I knew. So I got involved. Um, I was going to share something on the screen because Leanne mentioned this earlier and I forgot to share. This is Leanne at our, um, Leanne at our Citizens UK event that she mentioned earlier, uh, where we brought together those people to speak truth to power. So I got involved in nonviolent direct action um, and it was exciting and it was challenging and it changed me and my perception of the world. Um, here we are, for example, at the arms fair in London back in 2013, exercising the arms fair, about to sprinkle holy water on the Excel Center. And fortunately, some people in uniform got between us and uh, the target of our exorcism. The gentleman in front of me is uh, telling me if I sprinkle him with water one more time, I will be arrested. But we had a very civilized conversation and I explained to him that he could, of course, if he wanted to, but it would probably be easier all around if he didn't. And his colleagues convinced him uh, that I was probably right. I did sometimes wonder though, if it, as well as being something that was part of my spirituality, part of my faith, that I perhaps to one side was looking at myself as some kind of John Wayne in a dog collar. And uh, there might be some vanity as well as the genuine, uh, the genuine desire to seek change. I, um, I could tell you lots of stories of the things that we did, uh, but just uh, it was the usual things some of you will be familiar with, climbing over fences of uh, military bases, gluing our hands together to blockade things. And, um, and it was always different. Um, but it was always the same as well. And here were the things that I noticed that didn't change. Firstly, we never won anything. Um, nothing changed for the people that we wanted it to change for. Second thing I noticed there was that by and large, this was middle class protesters and blue collar police officers and absolutely zero decision makers. So I became concerned that perhaps what I was doing wasn't as meaningful on its own, at least, as I at first thought it was. When the adrenaline came down, I wondered actually whether or not this was what I should be doing with my energies and my time. And so I needed to take that hard question when you're doing something and and you've invested so much of yourself publicly as well as uh, privately to admit that you've got it wrong is quite tricky and loses your friends, I discovered as well. But I was determined because I met people many, many years older than me who'd been doing this nonviolent direct action for so long and never won a thing. And I could see my future. 
So I looked for something more, something else. And in the process, I discovered the writing of Saul Alinsky and of Walter Wink, a New Testament scholar who sadly died in, I think, 2012. Um, and it was, it was actually Walter Wink's writing on Jesus and nonviolence that encouraged me to read Saul Alinsky on broad-based community organizing, who, as I understand it, uh, had his inspiration from, um, uh, from within the Community of Christ movement as well, from leaders from the Community of Christ. So it all kind of comes around. We all stand on shoulders together. So I began to look for something else, something that was broader, more inclusive. Uh, and by inclusive, I mean genuinely we all participate together rather than those of us with power include those of us without power, but actually included from the beginning, from the foundations. And something which would actually bring about real change. But my other motivation, and I think it's the one that's driven me, and, and I think when I first had a conversation with leadership at the Community of Christ in Leicester, this was one of the things that I brought up there. Because I'm inspired, genuinely, like in front of you all, it can sound like I'm just saying it, but genuinely inspired by a tradition that has committed itself to being a peace church. A uh, church of justice, of peace, and genuine inclusion of all. But the challenge we so often get is, uh, is when people say to us, that's all very well, but nonviolence, it's not realistic in the real world, is it? So I would protest at a nuclear weapons factory or a drones base, and people would say, yeah, but it's lovely. It's a lovely idea, nonviolence. But come on now. Where have you ever seen it actually work in your life? And I could point people at leaflets from the Fellowship of Reconciliation about all the nonviolent revolutions that have been successful around the world. And statistics and facts that would demonstrate that nonviolent direct action uh, is, causes less bloodshed and is more likely to cause real long-term change in society but and i was reminded of this uh this week when i was reading a book by miles horton uh, a friend of paolo freire the educationalist uh and secretary of state for venezuela i think it was um for education uh miles horton said that you never change people's opinions through arguments but by putting them in situations where they have to act. So I found that my experience, that I've only ever really changed my mind about anything when I've been put in situations where I've had to act on the things that I believe to be true, and the map has not matched the terrain in front of me. And I think it's probably true, I think Miles Orton is right, it's probably true of all of us, so broad-based community organizing, to me, is a way that we can test some of the tools, just some of the tools, of nonviolence in order to build real relational power and get a seat on the table with those who have power over our lives. And you know what they say, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're probably on the menu. So. It's good to build this power together, this relational power, this power with. And I've seen that work at Citizens UK in Leicester, and now with my work across the UK, trying to build a, a case for care workers to be, pay, to be paid a real living wage. I want to share with you a diagram, which uh, I can't remember when I drew it many years ago, but which has been really useful for me over the years, um, which I think demonstrates how Jesus engaged with all sorts of people. I'm indebted to that a handbook for nonviolent resistors for their original version of this, which I've kind of theologized. Because as I read their original diagram, I noticed that, um, that I could see Jesus in their strategy. Strategy, uh, as Marshall Gans would say, is turning what you have into what you need to get what you want. 
And, uh, and I saw that with Jesus's ministry. And although the segments in the diagram you can see are equal sized, of course, he spent most of his time in section one and section two with the disciples and with the crowds, bringing vision and means and healing and community. And I tried to do this in the different campaigns I've been involved with ever since. With our Living Wage campaign, now we have, a, we have teams around the country who come together every two or three weeks to strategize, to work out how they can get their message across and build power. We're working with care workers, helping them to tell their story in a way which brings about change with others, but also working with them on their own professional well-being, on helping them find solutions to the challenges and the injustices that they see and learn to speak truth to power. Together with those care sector workers and leaders of faith and education, charities and unions, we are then engaging with what I would call the sympathetic elite, just as Jesus met sympathetic elites amongst the Pharisees and amongst even the Roman uh, centurion. And so we bring teams of people to meet with uh, leaders of county councils or with large employers of care workers or with members of parliament. And uh, most recently with, uh, if you're from the UK, Jacob Rees-Mogg, who is the chair of the House of Commons. And we invite them to become allies with us. Uh, so uh, they become part of, uh, they become on our side um, and allow our leaders to tell their story to more people. We have then come into action, public demonstration. And so people around the country uh, went out to care homes very recently during lockdown, stood outside, socially distanced, and had services of blessing and thanksgiving for everyone who worked in those care homes. And there are times, of course, in campaigns when you need to get to something a bit more agitational and uh, theological even. And one of the first times I uh, used this diagram to help me map out something was in a campaign in 2010, at the beginning of austerity in the UK, big cuts to public services. And they were closing the libraries uh, in our county. Uh, 11 libraries were being closed nine in the poorest areas in the county. And uh, one of those was our parish. And we were told that everybody would be within 20 minutes of a library. At a public meeting, I asked, by what means? And of course, they meant by car. They didn't realize that 70% of the people who lived where I lived had no access to a car. For uh, the person who cleaned the youth group, for example, to go to the library with her two children, would cost her uh, nearly an hour's pay. That might say something about how much she was paid as well, mind you. So we built uh, relational power through five local institutions, including two churches and a residence committee. And, uh, and we built public action as well as legal action. And amongst those people decided to hold a crucifixion of the library this surprised me because very few of them were people of faith, but this is what they wanted to do. So we took a six foot wooden cross, covered it with books, and 70 people gathered in candlelight outside the library. And we personally named the people who were deciding to close our library. And they sang that spiritual song, Were You There When They Crucified My Library? 70 of us, only five people who were regular churchgoers, but all of us doing theology and sharing the good news and talking not just of the crucifixion of innocent scapegoats like Jesus and like our public services, but also beginning to talk about resurrection and what that might look like. So we're working on a living wage and um, I want to spend the next last 10 minutes just connecting that if I may, with scripture and um, with a particular text. 
that means a lot to me, which is uh, Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16, the, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. I'm going to just read it, if I may. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, and about three o'clock he did the same, and about five he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner. I'll stop there. Uh, and many of you will be familiar with it. But it takes me back to the beginning of what I was saying about reading the scripture from a point of view. Because I read it from my privileged point of view, and I saw a story about generosity and a story about um, uh, how these people were idle and God was generous to them even though they were idle. But then if you've ever been in a, a job center or uh, in the jobs market long enough and not been fully able-bodied or been somebody who is discriminated against for any reason, you'll know that it's not quite that simple. You'll know that the people who were hired first are likely to be the strongest and healthiest looking. And the people who were hired at the very end of the day would have been the least physically able to do the work in the vineyard. Now, my only real connection with that is that is being picked for the football team at school. Um, I bet I'm not the only one here who was picked last uh, for their football team. And I can see a few people who also were. Realizing that what's going on in this story is that people are moving from being landowners to day laborers who are fit and healthy to day laborers who become poorer and poorer and less and less fit and less and less healthy and less able to work until they're picked last and only get a few hours. We realize that this is a story that challenges our approach, which often people talk about as meritocracy, as though meritocracy is a good thing. In fact, I remember somebody saying to me recently, surely as a Christian, you believe in meritocracy. I said, surely as a Christian, I couldn't possibly, because I believe in grace, not meritocracy. But also as a person, quite frankly, on the left, uh, I believe from each according to their ability and to each according to their need. And we see that so clearly here. The stories we've heard from care workers across the UK during the coronavirus lockdown has been stories of incredible courage, but also of increased poverty. Many are not paid a real living wage and have to work more than one job, putting both themselves and their clients at risk. Many don't have the proper protection that they need. And the rate of turnover of staff is high as people find they just can't survive in that work. We spoke to a member of government about this, uh, a person, and he was a person of Christian faith. And he said that he believed that indeed care workers should be paid more, but shrugged his shoulders. Where was the money to come from? We then asked him how. Uh, it might resonate with his faith to pay care workers a proper 
real living wage? To which he simply answered, a worker is worth their wages. And that, let that be his whole answer. I think that means that he knows, actually, what the right thing to do is, uh, just as we do. That uh, God's economy, God's generous economy, is very different from the economy we see around us. Many of us, and I've seen in the chat countries that people are from, uh, both the UK, uh, Canada and America, the Netherlands, um, and other places too, we're in countries where we're led to believe that a strong economy is necessary to look after those who are vulnerable, rather than a good economy so that nobody is vulnerable. Because there isn't one amongst us who would prefer charity to justice, given the choice. And so we see in Jesus through all his teachings, I think, a commitment both to nonviolent resistance, but also to a kind of economy which is generous and forgiving. And whenever we see Jesus talk about forgiveness, we know he means a political forgiveness, a forgiveness of debts, remembering that everything is God's commonwealth. Uh, something which I remember being taught by my friends in the Society of Friends uh, when they introduced me to Gerard Wynne Stanley and the Digger Movement and their commitment to the earth is God's commonwealth for all. So as we think about Jesus' words about good news, echoing those of Isaiah, and what good news to the poor might mean, I hope it means the peace of Christ, which is different from the pacification of the world. And I hope it means not charity, but rather justice. Jim Wallace uh, from the Sojourners movement in the US often says we're very good at pulling drowning people out of the river, less good at going upstream to seeing who's pushing them in, which is a good analogy, but no one can be in two places at once. So I quite like to say instead that we, the church, are good at being steam valves for an unjust system, but we're less good at being whistleblowers. But actually, it's very straightforward to be both. That as we are doing our works of mercy, as the Catholic workers would say, we help those who receive mercy to build and fight for justice at the same exact time. So I'm going to stop there and hand over, I forget to whom, to facilitate a couple of questions. And I think we have a couple of minutes for that. Thank you, Keith, and um, uh, thank you for a very warm and provocative and passionate presentation. Uh, your story has helped illustrate also your work. Um, we will now take questions from the audience uh, for a few minutes, so feel free to write them in the chat function, and uh, we will read them, uh, and, uh, and you can answer them as, as we go. Um, Keith, so thanks, Harry. Yeah, I'm seeing here uh, a first question. Vladimir Putin famously stated that you can do a lot more with politeness and a weapon than just with politeness. What is your view on backing nonviolence with the promise of potential violence, or grace and mercy with the promise of potential justice? So controversially, I would never see myself as a, as a pacifist. Um, and it's partly because I just don't think I'm entitled as somebody with so much privilege to tell people who are oppressed that they cannot use violence. But I do see that nonviolence seems to be pragmatically, if not ethically, the solution. Uh, so why would we use violence? Because the state will always have a monopoly on it. I don't know about politeness. Politeness in the hands of Vladimir Putin is... Uh, is that uh, old analogy of democracy, uh, it, which is having a bulldog and a, a big stick and a smile or whatever it was. 
Um, but I think we can be kind and agitational and courageous. Uh, I can't remember which author it was that said that nice people make the best Nazis. Uh, it, she was a child of a Holocaust survivor, so her mum knew this. Uh, it came from her mum. Nice people make the best Nazis. And, uh, and I think there's some truth in that. Politeness is usually in the hands of those with violence uh, in their other hand. Um, uh, shall I, I can uh, shall I have a look at the question, question as next? well? Yeah. yeah. So, and then there's a question about Assange I can briefly mention. I have been involved uh, many years ago outside the High Court in an Assange uh, for a question from Johan. Um, when offering aid, how do we empower those in our care? So we have a saying in organizing that a uh, few, one is that uh, never do for others what they can do for themselves. And then one from Jane McAlevey, an amazing organizer who organized 90% union membership in hospitals in Nevada. She said, your people are made of clay, not glass. What we try to do is find uh, the gift of leadership amongst those who are on the sharp end of injustice and uh, help them to train one another and be trained in how to use that leadership to get justice for themselves. And uh, that's what broad-based community organizing really is. It's leadership development for public life, teaching people to build their own power for their own issues, uh, to get their own justice. And the job of the community organizer, by and large, is to get out of the way and let that happen. We may, Elroy, do we have time? Elroy, do we have time for one more? Or? Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't see anything coming up here. That's fine. So, um, is there one from you? From me? I'm, I was just very excited about the, the, the model that you presented, uh, the, the one with the, the, the fan model, I suppose that's what I could call uh, it. Uh, I, I thought that was very interesting and very encouraging, uh, to, to combine the idea of nonviolence with this with this uh, community organizing, so so that that is uh, that is a hopeful uh, model, and and that gives insight into how Jesus also worked. So it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm very happy for that to be shared liberally afterwards, if there's a way, if anyone would like. Thank you. So that was just a comment, but uh, let's pass on now the the word to Richard James, who will be presenting the award. <laughs> We now come to that part of our ceremony when we present the 2020 European Peace Award to Keith Hebden. Thank you, Keith, for your presentation this evening. The award is given for your community organising within the Citizens UK in Leicester and ongoing passion for peace and justice. Keith, today we thank God for you and celebrate as sisters and brothers in Christ. As we recognize the significant contribution that you are making for peace and justice in the UK. You lead by example with your humble presence. Community of Christ in the British Isles and Western Europe mission centers are especially pleased that you are willing to accept and to be the inaugural recipient of the Community of Christ European Peace Award. Community of Christ has held peace colloquies for many years. Two years ago, we held our first one, and this is the first one that we, we are given a peace award to recognize people around places where we live for their exemplary work for peace and justice. Community of Christ, we proclaim Jesus Christ the peaceful one, and promote 
communities of joy, hope, love and peace. Inclusive communities where there is no poor or oppressed. We believe that peace is possible on and for the earth and that poverty and needless suffering can be abolished. Keith, we recognize your commitment to work for justice as you live out your Christian faith. We hope that in some way what we are doing today is an expression of our gratitude for what you do. You are a blessing. You are an excellent example of showing what can be done when hearts are focused on God's will for shalom, justice for all. This award recognizes your advocacy and action, raising awareness and your commitment to working to make this place a better place for everyone. We call it the kingdom of God has come. Zion, the peaceable reign of God. You are an inspiration to many. So continue to work for justice and peace. Continue to stand with those that have no voice. For the poor, the misplaced, marginalized in our society. And you have our commitment that we, as your sisters and brothers in Christ, are right beside you. Unfortunately, we physically cannot be together this evening to present you with this peace award. But we are aware that you have been sent the award in the post. I would now like to invite your daughter, Martha, on behalf of Community of Christ, to present to you with the Community of Christ Euro Peace Award 2020. You're on mute, Keith. Uh, speechless, you see. Um, if I may respond very briefly to you, but I, I just, so I decided very early on as an activist that, you know, we get so much flack and grief from people we've never met uh, who um, attack us publicly and privately, that any, any encouragement you ever get, just grab it and don't worry about uh, whether or not you deserve it. And just take it and be grateful for it. And so I really just want to say how encouraged I am by this and how I know in years to come when, if anything, as it inevitably will, gets tough and hard, this will be one of the things that keeps me going through those difficult times. Um, so thank you for that. And I'm trying to understand, I guess, what I think it means, uh, because I know it doesn't mean I'm the most peaceful 2020, and I know you don't think it means that either. But I guess... Uh, how it feels to me is that you as the community of Christ uh, and me as this Church of England uh, recovering vicar have crossed paths through the community of Christ congregation in Leicester. And, and I'm honored that in me, that that community has seen a fellow traveler of peace. And it, if that award, this award can mean that, um, that you have recognized me as a fellow traveler, then that's, that's the honor I'd like to receive from you. And I'd just like to say a big thank you for that. And, um, and folks in Leicester, I miss you. And I wish I could still be with you there in Leicester too. Thank you, Richard, on to, and to everybody who's uh, here to be part of this bit of this evening too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure he won't mind, but I have got a picture of it for those that could, can't see. So we're now going to move into a, into a time of, of reflection again, of peace um, and of, of music as well. So at this time, what we would like you to do is think of that question, what would you do for peace? And in a moment, you see a fire on the screen that's going to burn. 
Um, and you're also going to hear Nick playing his gu guitar. And during that time, if we could ask you to put it into the chat box in no more than one sentence, um, as we're going to read some of them out, um, what you would do for peace. And as you read them out, me, Danny and Liam, we're going to take it in turns um, to, put, to take what you've put in the chat and present it to God. Um, so Danny, if you, if you could please start that fire for us. God, please be with us as we learn to truly listen to people who may disagree with me. God, please be with us as we try not to shy away from the opportunities that are around us. God, please be with us as we listen to those that are challenged by a lack of inner peace or of family peace. God, please be with us as, we, as I share all my earthly wealth and goods with those in need. God, please be with us as we learn to recognise the opportunities in our environment. God, please be with us as we, as we try to act with kindness and with love as we march for BLM. God, be with us as we continue to speak up. God, be with us as we listen more and learn more about other people's lives. God, be with us as we share the power. God, be with us and help us to have a greater understanding of all religions and seek the good in them. God, be with us as we learn to compliment and not judge others. God, be with us as we stand up for justice. God be with us as we vote for more peace. God be with us 
as we be more aware. God be with us whilst we pay attention. And God be with us in the pursuit of peace. You are called to create pathways in the world for peace in Christ, to be relationally and culturally incarnate. The hope of Zion is realised when the vision of Christ is embodied in communities of generosity, justice and peacefulness. Above all else, strive to be faithful to Christ's vision of the peaceable kingdom of God on earth. Courageously challenge cultural, political and religious trends that are contrary to the re reconciling and restoring purposes of God. Pursue peace. Pursue peace. Pursue peace. Well, thanks, Dave, Leanne, and Danny, Richard, Keith, and Martha for organizing and participating in this first European Peace Awards ceremony. A special thank you to Joey, Henning, and Ryan, and Andrew, who have also uh, worked very hard behind the scenes and sometimes in front of the camera, uh, and who have made this European Peace Colloquy a success. Uh, we will send you a final list of links for all the webinars and podcasts when they are complete. We are very glad to, to report that we've had over 400 registrations and attendance has been from at least 100 to nearly 300 for any one webinar. So your enthusiastic participating has exceeded our expectations. Again, a very big thank you to all of you for coming and being here with us uh, in this particular Peace Award Ceremony tonight, the last uh, of this European Peace Colloquy webinar series. Thank you. Thank you.